I'm Trenes Armando Pascua, uh, an associate professor of the University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines, here to present the development of a chlorophyll meter for plant nitrogen estimation in agriculture using microphyton in APAC, PyCon APAC, Thailand 2021. So in the Philippines, as well as in other Southeast Asian nations, conventional farming is still the norm in tilling the lands. And this actually results to inefficiencies, particularly, for example, in labor costs, as well as in other aspects like nitrogen uh, fertilization and also pesticides application, which results to um, loss in income and also be due to the inefficient operation, which will entail greater wastage in terms of inputs, as well as inefficiencies in producing outputs. One inefficient method of aspects of conventional farming is in the application of fertilizer because farmers in the conventional method use apply fertilizer based on experience and also on established uh, fertilizer application rate. For example, the established rate is around, let's say, eight sacks per hectare or 10 sacks per hectare. And because of this, fertilizers are applied based on guesswork. So, and this will inherently give rise to either over fertilizing or under fertilizing, which will result to uh, income loss for farmers. Now, nitrogen is a very important component in plant because nitrogen is the main component of chlorophyll, which actually is the green pigment, which is the essential component along with the sunlight to produce plant food. Now, protein is the substance which makes up all living matter and protein is stored in grains of fruits and seeds of plants. Also in the plant tissue, nitrogen is a very important component. And for the well-functioning of roots, okay, in terms for it to have a good nutrient and water uptake, they must also rely on nitrogen for a good root system for plants. So you see nitrogen is a very important component in plant health. Now, how do we measure the exact nitrogen content in a particular plant. And if we could measure the exact nitrogen content, then we'll be able to determine how much nitrogen fertilizer we're going to apply to a particular plant. So you see here, photosynthesis is actually the process of creating food, but particularly the sugar. No? So it combines chemical energy plus carbon dioxide to produce sugar, which is the main substance for the utilization of energy for the plant's health, as well as the production of byproducts such as fruits and plant tissues. Now, the main component in the leaf known as chlorophyll, which consists of the chloroplast, is actually the one used in combination with sunlight and carbon dioxide to produce sugar in the process known as photosynthesis. Photosynthesis relies on the chlorophyll, and if you look at the concent uh, if you look at the uh, chemical composition of chlorophyll, so you can see that there is a large concentration of nitrogen. So suffice to say, nitrogen can be measured, okay, or the, the nitrogen content of a plant can be indirectly measured by just looking at the chlorophyll concentration of plants. So if plants has a lot of chlorophyll, then we can say that it is quite healthy and there's a lot of presence of nitrogen. Now, in the conventional method of nitrogen estimation, we have what we call the leaf charts, wherein leaves are being compared visually to a printed chart. And from this uh, printed chart, the printed chart will recommend the amount of nitrogen that must be applied to a particular crop. For example, here we have the, uh, the rice crops. Now, the problem with this method is that this is actually dependent on human perception. So if you are in a very light environment and therefore a very dark green, a dark green color can be estimated as a light green color. And also in the conditions where in, if you are in a very dark environment where it is uh, less presence of light, then a light green can become, can be perceived as dark green. So this results to inaccuracies in the application of the fertilizer since 
the recommendations of leave charge is highly dependent on human perception. So it's quite not scientific in a sense. So in the advent of technology, there are now the presence of chlorophyll meters. So these are actually commercial meters, which actually measures the chlorophyll of plants okay, using a non-destructive method, wherein they just clip the leaf to a particular aperture in the instrument, and it will measure the relative chlorophyll concentration of plants. However, these uh, meters are quite expensive for a typical farmer here in the Philippines because one particular unit will cost them around 300 to 500 US dollars. And in our, in our country, the source of uh, this chlorophyll, uh, chlorophyll meter is non-existent simply because uh, there's a little demand for this and thus uh, suppliers were not able to stock them locally in the Philippines. So if you have to buy them, then we need to go online and go to um, foreign sources, which is actually leads to the hassle in acquiring all of this. And also this leads to, of course, this is being important, then this leads to additional over cost overhead for our typical farm. Now, because of that fact, um, since farmers in the Philippines doesn't have that instrument, then they result to therefore fertilizers that are applied based on guesswork again. And if you apply guesswork, 30 to 50% of the harvested crop were rejected due to lack of nitrogen content. So if you over fertilize, that is also, if you over fertilize, that is detrimental to the plant because this will give rise to a lot of foliage and eventually some nitrogen will also lead to a production of many enzymes wherein pests will be able to detect it and therefore there are more pest infestation for an over fertilized uh, plant. Same goes in the end of the spectrum if you minimize fertilization this will also result to less nitrogen and therefore less photosynthesis and less tissues and less health for the plant which eventually lead to poor harvest for your particular crop. Now, due to these inefficiencies, of course, uh, our team developed Clomet, which is a low-cost chlorophyll meter, which is similar to the SPAD 502 or 7100 chlorophyll meters, but we differentiate ourselves by the fact that we make it as low-cost as possible. So the Clomet also comes with an application or an app wherein the device will communicate with the app and then the app will estimate or recommend the required nitrogen filterizer that must be applied for each particular plant of plant. So this is how the Clomet works. So it has an LCD wherein one can have a visual feedback of how to use the plant. So it has an aperture wherein you can insert leaves and try to, you can then measure the relative chlorophyll content of a particular leaf. So, so it also comes with a companion mobile phone app that will recommend the required fertilizer that will be applied to a particular device. So in the future, we're going to upgrade this also so that it will be able to recommend uh, the other types of fertilizers and other types of elements like phosphorus and potassium. Now, there are different types of chlorophyll meters used to estimate leaf chlorophyll content. So these are the techniques when one has to measure chlorophyll in the non-destructive method. So we have the transmission based chlorophyll meter wherein uh, red and infrared lights is being transmitted through the plant. And then we measure the relative intensities of the transmitted lights. In the fluorescence based chlorophyll meter, the uh, both red or green light is actually uh, transmitted to a chlorophyll to a leaf 
and chlorophyll is measured based on red fluorescence or far red fluorescence. In other words, sorry, the fluorescence is the production of uh, photons of light, okay, which will then be measured by the particular instruments or by a particular sensor. And the third method is the canopy reflectance sensor, wherein visible and near infrared light is uh, bombarded to the plant. And then the measured reflected uh, visible light and near infrared light is measured. And this actually the third method, the canopy reflectance sensor method is actually the most convenient method. But um, of course, uh, this will also leads to errors. So the Clomet actually uses transmitted space chlorophyll meter measurement. This is because by the fact that based on study, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, which are the different chlorophylls in plants, is actually uh, absorbed okay, by chlorophyll. That means uh, chlorophyll is most sensitive to infrared light, uh, red, red light, particularly in the 640 nanometer range. Okay. And also in the infrared light range, which is around 900, um, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B exhibits the largest amount of absorbance. And based on Beer's law, okay, it states that the absorbance of a Chlorophyll is dependent on the molar, molar absorption coefficient and the length of light path to the absorbers and the concentration of absorbers. So from this formula, the absorption coefficient of a particular leaf is directly proportional to C, which is the concentration of absorbers. And that can also be translated into an electronic means for the transmission method the absorption is actually the logarithm of the incident light over uh, the transmitted light over the incident light. So in other words, the absorption is a percentage between the ratio of the transmitted light and the incident light. Okay, so IO over I is always less than one, which goes to the absorbance of a system. So Beer's law is actually the principle used for the creation of the transmitive method of chlorophyll meters. So the SPAD 502 actually determines the relative amount of chlorophyll present by measuring the abundance of the leaf in two wavelength regions, which is particularly in 650 and 940 nanometer range. Okay. And in SPAD 502, this uses the transmitted method, transmissive method of chlorophyll determination. So as you can see the diagram, um, infrared light, which is 931 nanometers wavelength, as well as the red light, which is actually in 653 nanometer wavelength, is being bombarded to the leaf. And the transmitted light, which is uh, coming out from the leaf, is directed to a detector, a light detector, which will measure the relative concentrations of the, trans of the, uh, of the transmitted light. So we can perceive that the, since chlorophyll absorbs uh, red and infrared light, so we can assume that there is a lessening of intensity of light when it enters the leaf. And from that, we can have the chlorophyll concentration index which is the ratio of the percentage of transmission of the infrared light over the percentage of transmission of the red light. Okay. So this is the typical formula wherein we can get the M, which is the relative uh, chlorophyll concentration is equal to the K, then the logarithm of the transmission uh, intensities of the red and infrared light. And from this formula, of course, uh, we can therefore create a program wherein 
we can have the theoretical application of or practical applications of transmissive type of chlorophyll networks. And based on this uh, calculations, okay, we'll be able to have a representative of the different uh, spot values or the different uh, chlorophyll concentration values based on the following charts of colors. So for example, a data from number six represents 44.8 as the CCI, while a light green, for example, in chart indicated by the number one has 20.1 as the CCI. So usually this is a relative concentration index, and this is the one measured by SPAD 502. So in the industry, this is known as the SPAD number. Now the sensor that we are going to use is the TSL2561, which is a digital, uh, which is a light to digital converter. So this is consists of uh, an analog to digital converter that actually detects no, the light received by two infrared and visible light detectors. So light, okay, will be detected by a by the visible light photodiode which will be fed to an integrating a analog to digital converter as well as the infrared light will also detect ir light and these two values is uh, stored to an analog to digital converter for retrieval by a processor and the processor could communicate with the sensor via the two wire serial interface known as i2c so our prototype consists of the following main components. So it has an ESP32 microcontroller. And for the sensor, as I said, it uses TSL2561 light to digital converter. And we employ two, inf two LEDs, which is the infrared LED and the red LED. Now for visual feedback, of course, we have an LCD display. And of course, the use of a user button. So this is the picture of the bare bones prototype and uh, found in the picture is the TSL2561 light sensor, which is hermetically sealed. And we therefore create an aperture, which is uh, our, our, our uh, measuring aperture wherein the infrared light and infrared LED and the IR LED is made to transmit light to a leaf. And that will be detected at the bottom of the <laughs> Uh, due to the presence of the sensor. So the device is actually programmed in MicroPython, which is the Python port for microcontrollers. So it is now possible to program microcontrollers in the plain old high-level language known as Python. And it is now common for embedded applications to use Python development due to this very wonderful application, which is MicroPython. So this is my desk where in, uh, this is where I developed the, the Clomet matter. So if you look at the snippets of the code, okay, here is a typical snippets of the MicroPython code, which is used to calibrate the sensor. So therefore, it has uh, two objects, which is the infrared and red, which represents the power of the infrared and red light. And then we have the IR call, which will actually get the calibrated value for the infrared. And um, we also get the red call, which is the calibrated value for the red LED. So typically when you try to measure or start measurement of the device, you need to calibrate it. And calibration means simply getting the transmitted infrared and red light. Then we have here another routine in MicroPython, which is the get n. This is where we get the SPAD value. What we do here is we get from the previous uh, routine, which is uh, Calib, we then get the actual n value by getting the infrared value and the ir the infrared value and the red value okay by getting the transmitted 
infrared and red signal from the CCS from the color sensor that is put at the bottom of the device. Okay. And from these two bottom, we, we use this formula, which is M equals to K log of 10 of the relative uh, transmittance of infrared over the relative transmittance of the red light. Okay. Therefore, we can then get the typical SPAD value. No? And you see here the return N. So get N actually gives the, is a function, which actually gives the SPAD value of a typical measurement. Then we have any typical snippets of the calibrate function. Okay. Here we perform calibration. So this function actually leads to the calibration of the instrument wherein the representative infrared and red uh, light, which is uh, the transmitted values, is recorded, measured, and then stored in the memory of the microcontroller. And this is the routine for getting the SPAD value. Okay. And it will give a result in the screen. Typically here, this is an example of application wherein the SPAD value is 6.75. So we also have uh, a typical counter, which counts the number of readings and also the average of the number of readings. Also, we have uh, graphical routines. For example, here, this is the splash screen, okay, represented by, of course, a buffer in the microcontroller memory, represented by the OLED buffer which actually is uh, equated to a series of bytes representing the pixel values of the LCD screen. Okay. So MicroPython is very also very good in creating user interfaces okay, in, in microcontrollers no? compared, to other micro, uh, compared to other languages or in it's quite a pain to generate uh, user interfaces in embedded systems. Now, once we have determined and the working, the working uh, device, then we need to calibrate it to make it accurate with the actual SPAD 502. So we did a series of calibrations by doing experiments in collecting leaves and then comparing the results of the measurement of our Clomet device compared to those measured by the SPAD 502. And the algorithm for SPAD number calibration is this, that we sample 200 leaves and we compare them. And from this comparisons, we perform linear regression. And from the linear regression model, we'll be able to generate a linear equation, which will now be used to program the device for subsequent measurement. So first up, we did 20 um, leaves just to have an initial K value of 20 using the formula. And from that, we have uh, calculated a resulting K value of 47. And from this 47, we have an average error of 1.03 and a percentage error of 3.3% compared to the actual SPAD measurement. And we also performed uh, calibration as well as measurements, experiments on Pelanopsis samples of leaves. Pelanopsis are actually high-grade orchids in Taiwan, which is a great industry. And Pelanopsis is a major industry in uh, the high-value cuttings, which will be usually um, sold at around six months or so, is, needs a lot of critical um, observation, or in other words, needs uh, rearing, and the SPAD 502 is typically used for the cultivation of these uh, Phelanopsis uh, orchids. And because of this, uh, we'll be able to sample the, perform an experiment of having different, uh, lots of samples of Phelanopsis leaves, and compare the result with, of course, our applications of our, or the measured value of our chlorophyll meter. So this is me doing the measurements. 
And we did uh, calibration measuring these around 200 samples using the SPAD5 auto measurement and our device measurement. And from these two, we get the difference and also the ratio between the SPAD measurement and our device. And from that, we will be able to get a calibrated value of our constant K to around 47, resulting to an average error of 2.7.275 and an average percentage error of 13.6%. Then we have, therefore, a scatter plot of the system, where in the reds is actually the actual SPAD values, and the black are the one measured by our instrument. So from that scattered values, we perform linear regression, and we came up with an estimated linear curve having a linear regression constants, a slope of around 1.01. Okay. And we have a linear equation known as y equals 1.01x. So from this, we have calculated a new value for k, which is 47.53. Okay. Now we applying that new linear regression equation to 100 leaves, okay, having a new value of k of 45.53, we were able to get an average error of 1.01 .01 and an average percentage error of 5.75, which is quite not quite bad. So this is a scatter plot of the previous uh, experiments having a K of 47.53. And this is the linear equation that we have derived for a K value of 47.53. Now, after getting the linear value of our linear equation, we then perform a destructive chlorophyll measurement in order to test if the values measured by our instrument correlates with the actual uh, real chlorophyll content, content concentration. Now, we can actually accurately measure the chlorophyll content by a destructive measurement wherein uh, leaves are, are actually punched. And that represented samples of the leaves, which is punched, is actually uh, weighed in, in terms of mass, and then mixed to a solution of a volume of mixture of around 80% propanol and 20% methanol. Okay? And from that mixture, we let it stand for 24 hours. And then we apply spectrophotometer measurements to check the absorption of a light between 645 nanometers, 652 nanometers, and 663 nanometer wavelengths. And from the following formula, we'll be able to get the relative concentration of chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B and the total chlorophyll in milligrams per grams uh, units. So this is actually a very accurate measurement of the actual chlorophyll content. So, so out of the 200 pelanosis leaves, we measured that values, the chlorophyll index using SPAD502 and our measured instrument. And also we perform the destructive method of uh, measuring chlorophyll using a spectrophotometer. And from this experiment, we'll be able to have generated the following uh, curves. So on the, right, on the left is we have the actual measurements of or the correlation between the actual SWAD 502 reading with the uh, actual chlorophyll content using destructive method. And on the right, we have the graph between our measured relative chlorophyll content of our clomet compared to the actual chlorophyll content. And from these calculations, it found out that uh, for both measurements, for example, for our uh, instrument for clomet, we have generated a relative coefficient of determination of around 0.675. And for the SPAD 502, we have a total uh, relative chlorophyll coefficient of determination of around 0.831. So from our measurement, we actually have, from our clomet device, we actually have a much higher relative uh, 
coefficient of determination compared to those of the SPAD 5.2. So we can therefore conclude that uh, our instruments is uh, actually at par with the SPAD 5.2 device. Now, lastly, how can we determine the chlorophyll and nitrogen plant content, or how can we correlate the chlorophyll and nitrogen contents in plants? So phrased from these two literatures, be able to get a formula that will correlate chlorophyll concentration with the nitrogen content of a particular plant leaf. And we can then use CLOMET to calculate end recommendation using the, for, uh, the concept of nitrogen sufficiency index. In this, in this formula, we are actually <laughs> getting the average meter reading from an unknown area in the plant. So, and then we get the average meter reading from another plant. So in this application, we have what we call a reference plot. A portion in your field wherein plants is consist, considered to be very healthy, and that will be your reference plot. And from that reference plot, you get the SPAD value readings, either from SPAD502 or in our sense from Clomet. And then on other samples and other areas, you measure the SPAD, average SPAD reading. And if you get the NSI for each particular representative samples, if the NSI is above 95%, then there's no need to apply for fertilizer. But if the NSI is below 95%, then that plant requires fertilization of nitrogen. And how do we calculate? So we have a formula that will calculate the required nitrogen based on the measured SPAD values. And of course, we have a representative number known as the critical value of nitrogen for the different plots, wherein the app will actually uh, determine that. So this work will be able to develop a chlorophyll meter that will be used as an alternative to SPAD 502 to measure the chlorophyll concentration on Pelonopsis, orchids therefore reducing costs. But not only in Pelonopsis at all, representative vegetable and fruit uh, crops. No? So the SPAD values is measured through light absorption of plant leaves in the two frequencies, particularly 650 nanometers and 940 nanometers for the two infrared and for the red light. No? So the calculated SPAD values of the developed chlorophyll matter actually provides a strong linear relationship with the actual chlorophyll content using the destructive method. So this means that this low-cost chlorophyll meter is reliable, non-destructive, and a good alternative for measuring chlorophyll content of the crop leaves. So thank you. And that's all for my presentation. And thank you for listening. And for more information, you can actually contact me in my email, jog underscore pasqua at usdp.ph. And also, I would like to acknowledge the uh, Taiwan universities, that is the Thai, Southern Taiwan University of Science and Technology and the National Chai University, where then I did my internship back in 2019. And this is where uh, the research work or this CLOMET was initially developed. So this was developed under the Taiwan TEEP Plus program of the Ministry of Education in Taiwan. So again, thank you for listening. And we hope that uh, we could connect if you are quite interested in this technology. And I'm again, I'm Joannes Pasqua, and thank you for listening. All right. So welcome to the live Q&A session for Data and IoT Track. Um, today, we are honored to have Dao um, as a um, as a speaker. And also, he's more than happy to answer your questions. So before we continue, um, allow me to introduce him to you first. So he's a um, he's a professor um, at University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines, and he's been a member of Python Philippine too. Um, so he preferred to be called by Diot. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm if I pronounce it correctly. Diot. Yeah. It's, it's Jog, the first yeah. four letter. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he he was he was graduated from um, the Department of Electronics Engineering. So yeah, without further ado, let's begin the Q&A session. So yes, Diogenes or Diot, right? Diot. 
Yeah. Um, so I I actually actually watch your talk, and um, I'm really impressed by how you incorporate the hardware and the software in into your tiny system that mm. um, actually measure the quantity of chlorophyll in the um, in the field. And um, <clears throat> just in case, if you guys have a question, just raise your hand, and then we can pick you up. Mm. Yep. So good afternoon, everyone. So, yes. um, so if you have any questions regarding the, the talk I have, uh, I'm feel free to answer it. So, I, uh, just for the introduction, actually, I'm a professor in a university in the Philippines, and actually, I started out Python maybe three years ago, and I'm it's just quite uh, I'm just quite new to the language but then i came from the c language and the assembly language background so transitioning to python if you're coming from the c language is rather easy right rather than and actually uh, coming from a lower level language so high level that's language, true it's much more uh the transition is not painless in a sense right and i do love python because uh through MicroPython, we will be able to put the Zen of Python in the embedded systems world, no? in the hardware. So yeah, I, I fell in love with Python because of the fact that uh, it's a simple and a very easy to use language. And the cleanness or the neatness of the language. And um, thanks to Damien George, Australia is able to port the Python into the hardware, particularly the... Mm microcontrollers so starting from i think 2017 uh we'll be wow. able to enjoy the python language in the microcontrollers so the joys that we have in the desktop python is now being enjoyed by us embedded systems programmer where in in the previous years this was more dominated by c and assembly language yeah. right yeah, and the built-in libraries is quite good also. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I've got a question. Um, yeah. While we're yeah. waiting for the audience to form the question, I, I, have, an, I have a question myself. So um, I've been coding on the desktop version of Python for, let's say, oh, how many years? I can't count. But anyway, um, what, what would be the difference between the, the, the desktop version of Python and the MicroPython? Okay, actually, uh, that lies on the optimization for, in, in a sense, oh, because um, in the desktop Python, or um, you have the hardware in your disposal. Actually, we have no consciousness of the hardware limitation, particularly if you look at the RAM, do we have gigabytes yes. or, of RAM? But in a small microcontrollers, you can contend to just kilobytes of RAM, so four kilobytes, I see. Something like that. So sometimes it's quite difficult to have one, two megabytes or four megabytes. Oh. So if you look at the RAM, <laughs> so that's also one of the reasons why it's very, quite difficult. It's just uh, turned out in year 2017 where in um, Python was ported to the microcontrollers because of the limitation of the hardware. And we know that oh. Python is a high-level language. Yes. And high-level language is actually power hungry in terms of memory, right? Yeah, it's memory. But of course, in the desktop Python, you have gigabytes of RAM. So no problem. Yeah. So Virtually no limit. No limits. But in micro Python or in the hardware, that's quite small. From gigabytes to sometimes kilobytes. You have to contend only with yeah. kilobytes in megabytes of RAM. <gasps> so just imagine if you have an array or, or, or a dictionary, for example, with length of 1000 then your ram is already <laughs> gone oh <laughs> right yeah i could imagine that wow so so that's the case so they will able to optimize the kernel the python uh, virtual machine clean all of it just go to the basics so that keep it working and they some they've done some tweaking on the the, the core python so that it could fit to a microcontroller with at least 16 mb ram and 256 oh, wow. kilobytes of uh, flash memory. That's remarkable. Okay, so yeah. that's the case. And yeah, you can now do Python, even if we also have the Python shell in the microcontroller itself. 
But again, you how you should have the consciousness that you don't ha you do have a limitation compared to what you have in the desktop PCs or in the I see. Python PCs. In, I see. in the desktop mm -hmm. Python. So and you love what the about program. The speed? The speed? I'm sorry. Yeah, also that's also the case because microcontrollers run at around uh, for example, the SP32, it runs it around 250 megahertz. Ooh. That's the speed. And Whoa. those that other low, lower end microcontrollers in the ARM processors, they run at around 100 megahertz speed. So that's as you can imagine, slow. that's quite, quite slow, right? But I think uh, it's also sufficient for some applications because our applications in the microcontrollers are quite embedded. And mm -hmm. the good thing about microcontroller applications is we are more in the controls rather than on the data processing in the desktop pc yeah. it's more on data processing so but in in in, in microcontroller world we are more on the controls so we mm -hmm. don't really okay have the need for very fast speed but again uh, we have seen the advent of the rise of hybrids and we say hybrids uh, it's a cross between microcontroller and microprocessors and microprocessors are actually entering the embedded worlds no, sort of like there's a small distinction now between microcontrollers and microprocessors and we have seen mm -hmm. that uh, because of that mm -hmm. embedded applications now is also pra more on data processing so we need higher speed and higher uh, memory, uh, plentiful devices, no? and actually ARM, the one I'm saying you, the <laughs> ARM, ARM, yeah, uh, <laughs> the ARM consortium, the one that produces or the IP for our uh, microcontrollers and cell phones, are actually doing that now. We're in particularly, for example, we have the AI for machine learning for edge devices. Yes. So ARM is doing that, and also Nvidia is doing that. Also, mm. they're in, they are now developing their their microcontrollers and their microprocessors to process machine learning uh, uh, models. No? And due to that, uh, there is now the rise of very powerful microcontrollers or microprocessors that we're able to do that. And thanks to MicroPython, it's now much easier, I think, yes. to do uh, embedded systems compared to the past. So uh, what MicroPython has done is that it has opened the doors for guys like you who are doing so much <laughs> good in the desktop PC or in the web space to enter into the MicroPython into the embedded systems world. Yeah, we have we have someone raising our hand. Uh, yeah, hi Saru. <laughs> hi Saru. Yeah. So actually, we have some questions in the live chat. Oh, right. Uh, oh. So yeah, I'll, I'll post some in there if you can see them. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but you guys are having a, such a good conversation. I didn't want to disrupt you. I think one of the questions, the other day is, is um, I think it was already posted. So for people interested in exploring agriculture tech, I see. what mm. other projects would you recommend for, for beginners? Do you have any pointers mm. there? And there's some more questions there, Arm as well. Okay. Okay, I see. So I think uh, the, the talk I have is about chlorophyll meter. We'll uh, mm -hmm. be able to measure, supposed to be the chlorophyll content at the same time, be able to um, get the nitrogen content in order for our farmers to not uh, be wasteful in terms of the fertilizers that they apply. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those who are interested in creating applications in the agriculture. There are actually a lot. So actually right now I'm doing around five or four, pro five or six projects in, in the agriculture realm because I do fell in love in agriculture because I think I do believe that in any country, agriculture is actually the backbone of the economy because we all eat, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, and no economy in the world will be able to live without agriculture. So uh, if you're going to develop projects in agriculture, it's quite easy. No? Um, I'm always an advocate of the fact that if, just like any other Python programmers were saying that, you, if you want to learn, if you're a beginner and you want to learn Python language, the most important thing is that when you learn, there must be a project that you need to do so that uh, you have a goal to do that and learn the language for that goal. 
And if you come to MicroPython, for example, and you have a microcontroller, mm -hmm. so when you try to learn, uh, sometimes we just learn by just doing it for the sake that we are experimenting with it in a sense that it, there is no direction mm -hmm. in a sense. So if you want mm -hmm. to learn MicroPython, then uh, try to create projects, try to create a goal. And that goal is at the end of the day, maybe for at the end of two months, you have someone to show that hey, I have created this, but you have a direction or in this device that I've created using MicroPython is able to solve a problem in agriculture or in other space. But in terms of agriculture, there are a lot of applications that you can do. I give you a hint. Okay. One is the prediction, for example, the prediction of the weather. We're in mm. farmers. Uh, the problem in our country and also I think in other Asian countries is that uh, farmers tend to produce a lot, but they don't have an inkling of if there a demand for our crops. So mm. if you could develop sensors that could, or, or you can do machine learning so that it will be able to predict na, based on the data of the, uh, the data of the production or the data of the demand for the, for the crops, then uh, that's a very good project. And another one mm -hmm. is the application of precision farming. So the one I did is in the realm of precision farming, mm -hmm. we'll be able to Precision farming means that uh, you'll be able to measure the parameters in the farm so that you'll be able to precisely okay, optimize the use of inputs. So in our case, in chlorophyll matter, it's fertilizer. Hmm. Okay, so you can also think of the water that we waste. So how can you optimize hmm. that so you have automated irrigations? And also, uh, I'm also a fan of creating instruments or gadgets <laughs> that are used in the farm. So sometimes we have instruments that are quite costly wherein our farmers will not be able to afford it so that they try to tend to do the guesswork. So Clomet is one of that because mm. if you're going to buy one, it's very expensive. So, But because of MicroPython and uh, the presence of microcontroller, you'll not be able to produce one at a much mm. lesser cost. At the same time, you are enjoying in a sense. So that is a, the chlorophyll. Chlorophyll meter or chlorometer is a sample of exactly it's the principle of a spectrophotometer. That's one basically found in laboratories. So a uh, spectrophotometer is quite expensive, right? So mostly the laboratories are unable to, uh, to afford that. But if you have the knowledge of microphyton, if you have the knowledge of electronics and the sensors and you can program in Python, then you can create your own instruments and you don't need to buy right. any more, right? So we're creating one right now for fishery. For example, we're mm. developing a fish freshness meter, okay, wherein you can determine the freshness of the fish. Now, just look at the space. No? Just look at your farmers and see the instruments that they really should need and try to do or develop a device for them. Okay, So I think that's the advice I can have for those beginners who want to learn MicroPython so, and create a device in the agriculture realm yep. and i think um when you want to create your own project it's going to be a prototype i would say it's a hardware prototype with MicroPython as as a backbone and in that sense once you can confirm or you can quantify the effort with respect to the accuracy or the the um what what you want to set what you want to measure and then you can yeah, uh, scale it up to industrial prototype or things like that. I think this is like a good start for mm -hmm. for any project yeah. related to architecture. Yeah. Oh, by the way, yes, um, there's a question right here. Um, so based on your experience, would you prefer the, um, the hardware that is already um, in the industrial grade or would you like to... You mean, I mean, create a prototype from scratch. Mm. So actually, uh, from my background, I have a personal bias on from scratch, right? Ah, because, I see. because it's because of the cost, right? And yeah. the reason why I'm creating devices is because for the fact that maybe one is I cannot afford to have those high-end instruments. Mm. So particularly those found in the laboratories. Okay, so if that's the case, then try to create one yourself, no? DIYN. Mm. 
sometimes um, device, these instruments are for those found in the labs is actually used for general use case no? and but mm -hmm. if you are a farmer for example if you are in for example hobbies you're just into state like uh, your hobby is a farm is, is planting or mm -hmm. farming then sometimes it's not a good idea to invest in this high end uh, instruments That's, right yeah <laughs> so rather than uh invest on this device so rather develop it so know of the principles of these uh, devices and then develop your own and right. i say that's you can customize it in a in a way mm -hmm. right and at the end of the day after if you find that if you fail then at least that's not that painful right? even your investors is quite small but if you are successful right, then you are actually hitting two things one is you have developed an instrument or a device mm -hmm. another one is of course you've learned you've learned a lot particularly uh, the programming language that can so and also for the case that uh, the difference between prototypes and mass scale production mm. so I think uh, all instruments always starts with the small scale and prototypes and when they proven that it's quite working in the field and been tested with the actual instruments and calibrated and that is the time we go to mass production right okay. so yes. I think it's the need that's we need to fulfill that's why i've developed these projects yeah hmm yep. and um oh yes Xinhui. okay we are waiting for Xinhui to turn on her microphone uh, sorry to turn on her camera yes. oh, okay I think we're just about out of time, so maybe one more quick question. Okay, yeah, yeah, yes. Then we can close. That'll be exactly. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so um, one last question. So, if you have also the sensors, like many kinds of sensors, would you like to share some ideas on the sensors available in the market so that everyone can grab the idea and then develop his own project? So actually, uh, there are a plethora and thousands, I think, of sensors that are in the market. Um, if you talk with embedded systems, particularly in schools, so I think the superstar is the Arduino, right? So everyone right. heard of the Arduino platform. It's an yes. AVR microcontroller. And thanks to Massimo Bansi, they were able to make a uh, lot of students or a lot of people go into sure. this realm. And because of the popularity of the Arduino, there came out a lot of DIY sensors in the market. Mm. So uh, light sensors, optical sensors, every sensors, I think there is already one found in, in, in the market. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, I think it's, but the catch of Arduino is that it is based on C++. Yes. Uh, and it's not based on Python, but thanks to MicroPython, we'll be able to program some of the different Arduino boards no, using Python. And what I can say is uh, those sensors that are quite popular in the market, in the web, that you can interface with the Arduino microcontroller, you can also do that now with MicroPython. So as I can say, those sensors that are found in the market, all of them could be able to work in MicroPython. So you'll have to just uh, shop around. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I think we are running out of time. So thank you very much, Diosh, for your um, fruitful discussion on the topic. And thank you, Andrew, as well, for hosting the session. And I would like to thank the audience for, um, for coming to this talk. So thank you very much. And I'll see you again very soon. Okay. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.